Uh, great to see all of you out uh, this morning. Welcome to the fifth annual symposium of the Stanford Neurosciences Institute, now the Wusai uh, Neurosciences Institute. It's a um, privilege to have you here. It's a privilege to have this distinguished panel of speakers that we have. And I know we have a lot of visitors in the audience from outside the university because uh, of the, the topic and the distinguished panel of visitors. So welcome, everyone. We are doing something different this year from the first four symposia that we've done. In the first four symposia, we've sort of had uh, a little something for everyone in a very broad neuroscience com community. We've had to, uh, tried to have some basic cellular and molecular neuroscience, some systems, some human neuroscience, uh, some neuroengineering. But this year, we decided to focus on a topic that seemed particularly um, timely, and that's on uh, the relation, or lack thereof, of natural and artificial intelligence. Uh, this, is a, this is timely because it's, it has implications for how the university should be planning its future and uh, for potential hires and things. And I just wanted to take you through briefly a little bit of the reasoning behind this and why we thought that this was important. Uh, the history of artificial intelligence arguably started with uh, these two guys here, with Frank Rosenblatt, who's on the left there, and Marvin Minsky on the right, uh, it, with the invention of the perceptron, which was a little algorithm that could be implemented on a computer that amounted to a very simple linear classifier. And it could take in inputs and do interesting things with them and produce uh, an, an interesting and useful output. But this field never really went uh, terribly far in the decades after 1970, largely because Minsky was really down on them and thought that they could, that there were certain kinds of operations, critical operations, that they just couldn't do. And uh, the next kind of major step forward really took place with these two guys uh, who worked together at UC San Diego in the 1980s. That's David Rummelhart on the left and our own Jay McClelland on the right. And Jay will be uh, moderating the afternoon session today. Uh, and they were the ones who really ushered in the era of connectionism and realizing if you uh, put these perceptron-like units chained together in uh, layers, three and, and uh, four layers deep, that they could actually do amazing things. And the work, the, the classic work that Romahart and McClellan did together was um, really in the area of, of word recognition. Um, but still, the computing power was so limited at the time, uh, there was no way you could chain multiple layers of these things together. But with the advances recently over the last decade in sheer computing power and in machine learning algorithms, uh, really brand new things have started to happen. And this is one of the ones, of course, that caught the popular attention and caught my attention as well. Uh, when, when DeepMind and Google's Apple, AlphaGo uh, uh, algorithm and, and program defeated uh, the Chinese Go master uh, in a win for AI. And I've, I've, at the bottom there is the first line from this New York Times article says, it isn't looking good for humanity. Uh, but this, this was a really interesting departure from previous uh, computer learning uh, and computer, well, it, computer approaches to board games because it wasn't really programmed, the algorithms weren't really programmed in in the classical sense of the word of taking strategy and translating it directly into algorithms. Uh, the unique feature of this particular machine is that it learned. It was a supervised learning machine, and it learned from rehearsing and playing for itself uh, millions and millions of, of plays made by individual human Go players. So when it actually defeated world champion Go player, um, it wasn't really, it was, it, was it really machine intelligence or not? It was really based on human intelligence, and sure, it could do it faster, and we know computers are faster than us. You know, so there's, there's some ways to kind of rationalize that this isn't such a breakthrough after all. But then in um, just a year and a half later, in October of 2017, the DeepMind group published this uh, remarkable paper here uh, with a new version of AlphaGo that they called AlphaGo Zero, uh, which mastered the game of Go without ever depending on human knowledge, without mimicking or, or learning from any, any human examples, basically by playing uh, Go with itself uh, using uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. And uh, this 
this program it was actually quite remarkable because it was able to, on its own, without interacting with human uh, moves or human history, it was on its own able to figure out strategies that it had taken Go players millennia to figure out. And um, it actually figured out new strategies that millennia of human Go players had not figured out on their own. And at that point, you have to ask yourself, well, maybe artificial intelligence is really here. Uh, when, when the machine is doing something at a peculiarly human enterprise that humans haven't been able to figure out how to do. And that's when I think a lot of us neuroscientists started looking more carefully, taking another careful look at artificial intelligence and saying, well, what kind of intelligence is it exactly? And does it bear any key resemblance to human intelligence? And what are the future of these fields? Are they going to go in parallel with each other, never touching each other? Are they really very distinctively different things? Or are they going to start interacting or a third possibility is that they actually start converging and really understanding intelligence at a general level. And that really is going to be the main subject of our symposium today. And at least some of our speakers are kind of more or less on the record of thinking that, of, of believing that they're going to interact. So this is a, a slide from Dan Yamans, who's a professor in psychology here at Stanford, and his former postdoctoral mentor, Jim, Jim DiCarlo, who's sitting right in front of me. Uh, and uh, Dan and, and Jim, have had Jim especially has had some long history studying the uh, uh, visual system of the macaque. And the visual system of the macaque, the temporal lobe, I don't know if this pointer is going to show up. We may need to get a different one. Um, but the, the, that macaque monkey brain up there has a series of visual areas. Uh, uh, it's almost like a series of layers or series of networks that go from the back of the brain down to the tip of the temporal lobe. And those different visual areas along that cascade of path cascading neural pathway have been studied intensively, and we know a lot. Thank you, sir. Okay. So we know a lot about the physiological properties of each of these stages from the retina to the thalamus to the first visual area and successively on up to temporal lobe areas that are involved in the uh, perception of faces and categorization of faces. And what Jim and Dan uh, did was actually train deep convolutional networks on the same sort of task that humans performed in, in, in visual object classification. And they started, once they trained these networks uh, that performed extremely well in recognizing and classifying uh, visual face images and other kinds of visual images, they actually went back and looked in the guts of what the individual computing units were doing in all of these layers and found that they bore certain very interesting resemblances to what natural neural units were doing uh, in their intervening layers. And that was without training at all, without training any of these layers to mimic what's going on at the data level. It was only training them to perform the behavioral task. And this, to me, was one of the most uh, intriguing and, at, at the time, compelling examples of uh, maybe there could be crosstalk. And you can see that Dan and, and Jim imply this with these little arrows connecting the artificial network to the natural network. Um, but others of our speakers are sort of on the record as well. This was a, uh, a paper that was published barely a year and a half ago from the DeepMind group, and uh, one of our speakers, Matt Botvinnik, is a co-author on this paper. And I call your attention to the title, Neuroscience Inspired Artificial Intelligence, and then this last sentence here is really interesting. In this article, we argue that better understanding biological brains could play a vital role in building intelligent machines. Um, so that's a pretty bold declaration, and Matt is actually head of the neuroscience operation at DeepMind in London. And then uh, another of our speakers today, Greg Corrado, uh, who did his PhD here at Stanford, as I believe Matt did as well, uh, Tom Dean and Greg and John Schlenz from Google Brain, uh, recently rechristened Google AI, because I guess AI is cooler than the brain now. Uh, <laughs> wrote this paper, Three Controversial Hypotheses Concerning Computation in the Primate Cortex. And I've read the whole paper, but to get the drift, uh, you know, when they talk about these three hypotheses or questions, just get a load of this sentence right here. Is the mind modular in terms of its being profitably described as a collection of relatively independent functional units? I mean, these guys don't waste any time. Right here in the abstract, they go to the mind. Forget the brain, we're going to the mind, all right? So uh, bring it on, let's see what you got. 
Um, but there, you know, there is this kind of um, wandering out and, uh, you know, real speculation about where this is going and whether artificial and natural intelligence studies are going to converge or going to talk to each other creatively. And this should be a really fun symposium today. It's a stellar lineup of speakers. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, Surya and Doina Precup and Feifei, our own Feifei Lee here at Stanford, who's a major figure in artificial uh, machine vision, uh, they will weigh in on this topic, uh, as will Jim and Matt and, and Greg. Um, and then I'll just highlight one other thing that at, at noon, at 12.15, just before the lunch break, we will have a special announcement about the Institute and the uh, renaming of the Institute. Today is the last day of existence of the Stanford Neurosciences Institute and the first day of existence of the Wusai Neurosciences Institute. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Scott Delp, uh, professor of uh, bioengineering here at Stanford and uh, sits on the executive committee of the Neurosciences Institute and all-around great guy. And Scott will moderate our opening session. Thank you.